Hello, and thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Generation Jihad. I'm Bill Raggio, and I'm here with my friend, colleague, and partner in crime, Tom Jocelyn. How you guys doing? We hope you and your family are well during these challenging times. Hopefully, we'll give you something else to think about for the next hour. Today, we'll be discussing the drone wars, or how the U.S. has come to rely on targeted killing in lieu of comprehensive strategy to defeat terrorist groups. Drones have become a mainstay in U.S. counterterrorism ops. They've targeted key leaders, operatives, and even low-level fighters for jihadist groups. The U.S. has relied on drones as a tactic over time, particularly in areas where it is difficult, if not impossible, to insert U.S. Special Operations Forces. Pakistan, I'm looking in your general direction. But the U.S. has used drones elsewhere. Drones have become a favorite of political and military leaders who want quick results and are adverse to taking U.S. casualties. Um, when you insert special forces teams in, in dark areas and areas where jihadists control territory, it can be very dangerous. And the U.S. has taken casualties from special operations teams when they've gone into places like Yemen to kill or capture senior al-Qaeda leaders. For the purpose of this discussion, we're only going to discuss drone strikes in areas outside of active hostilities. There's a, the reason for this is in areas where the U.S. is in active combat operations like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. These are declared areas of op military operations. So they're not just using drones. They're using conventional aircraft. And you have a lot going on in these, air, in these areas. It's not as sort of interesting or it's not just a counterterrorism function often. There's also usually a counter um, counterinsurgency component to this. So... Um, it, again, the area, areas outside of active hostilities where the U.S. has focused its drone campaign, this would be primarily be Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. Uh, the U.S. conducted its first um, counterterrorism strike in 2002 inside Yemen. It killed Abu Ali Harithi. He was the master. He was one of the masterminds of the U.S.S. coal bombing. Seventeen American sailors were killed in this attack. The next reported use of drones was in 2004. The U.S. targeted. Nek Muhammad, he's an, a Pakistani Taliban leader who organized thousands of Pakistani jihadists to fight against U.S. forces in Afghanistan. He was killed in a strike in, in South Waziristan in Pakistan. Inside Pakistan, the U.S. launched a handful of strikes between 2005 to 2007. I believe there were somewhere around 15 strikes during that time. But then by 2008, once the uh, Bush administration really decided to ramp up this campaign, there were 35 strikes that year. And then once the Obama administration came in, the, the, the pace of the activity really picked up. By 2010, the campaign in Pakistan hit its zenith. There were 117 strikes against al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and its branch, the Haqqani Network, um, the Islamic movement, Uzbekistan, the Turkestan Islamic Party, a host of Pakistani, Afghan, um, jihadist groups were targeted during these strikes and a large number of senior al-Qaeda and other jihadist leaders were killed as well as well as a, a number of key operatives. After after 2010, the, the strikes began tapering off. They almost began to have after each year. The last reported strike in Pakistan that I have been able to detect was in 2018. And interestingly enough, this was when the Trump administration started to put pressure on Pakistan to do something about the Afghan Taliban. But and he indicated that, uh, you know, that the Pakistanis would pay a price. And yet that year, the drone campaign ended inside of Pakistan. But during the drone campaign, um, the majority of the strikes, 95% of them based on the strikes that I've recorded, um, they took place in the in two tribal areas in Pakistan's federally administrated tribal areas. These were in North and South Waziristan. Um, there were a, a handful of strikes that took place outside of, uh, of these two tribal agencies. This was despite the fact that Al-Qaeda and a host of other jihadist groups that the U.S. was targeting had an extremely wide footprint throughout Pakistan. They weren't just located in these kill box of North and South Waziristan. Al-Qaeda leaders could be found in Pakistani cities, Peshawar, Quetta, Karachi, Osama bin Laden was killed in Abbottabad, etc., etc. So this is this is the where the campaign sits inside of Pakistan as today. We haven't had any strikes over the last two years recorded against Al-Qaeda, but we still know Al-Qaeda operates there. So Bill, I know you started tracking the drone strikes years ago. Do you remember when you started doing that? I don't even remember anymore. I mean, did you start 
you started comp- compiling a database on this, basically tracking the guys who were targeted, trying to figure out which jihadists were targeted. Do you remember when you started doing that? Yeah, actually, it's it's funny. I actually thought that the the first the very first strike against Nek Muhammad in 2004 in Pakistan that caught my attention because while the the Pakistani military was on an operation against the you know I don't want to get into a whole discussion of good versus Taliban here but they were going out against the jihadists that they didn't like right in in north and south Waziristan particularly uh, based on the direction of the US but the US left that fight to the to the Pakistani military but in by 2004 um, Nick Muhammad, he, he was one of several jihadist leaders, several Pakistani Taliban leaders who were organizing uh, military operations against U.S. forces in Afghanistan. This is when the, um, the Taliban was making its comeback. So I thought that strike was it was very um, it was very interesting. It, it caught my attention right away and said, wow, the U.S. is actually conducting military operations, counterterrorism operations inside of Pakistan. So I started tracking it right from then. Um, it started, you know, it was not much of a database to begin with. I believe there was one strike in 2004, there were two in 2005, you know, three the next year. So there's just a couple of handful of strikes. Then by, um, I believe it was 2007 or eight, it became very clear that this was something that was increasing. By 2007, there was, uh, I believe, 10 strikes. And then by 2008, another 35. And I put together the data. I was just tracking... Um, what I was really interested in, where were we targeting, um, who were we targeting, um, you know, who's, what areas were being controlled, um, or like who, you know, which group controlled the areas, right? Um, you know, you actually, you know, Bill, you, you talked about 2007, 2008. It's interesting. I went back to the story of all this, to track all this and to figure out how this evolved over time. And it struck me, and actually I think you and I both wrote something different about this at the time. In 2006, you remember there was that airliner plot against those uh, jets leaving Heathrow in London. And basically Al-Qaeda had orchestrated this plot. There was this idea that it was just sort of, you know, at first there was sort of this uh, confusion over whether or not it was really an Al-Qaeda plot or not, right. but it turned out it really was. And it turned out that it was orchestrated from Al-Qaeda operatives in northern Pakistan, from Waziristan. And I remember writing something at the time, I think I was in California on a vacation or some sort of seminar or something, and I took a break at lunch and I wrote something saying, you know, uh uh-oh, basically you can see these plots now are coming from northern Pakistan. What's the Bush administration going to do about it? And some on the left sort of freaked out online. I remember seeing some, I think it was Mother Jones or something, wrote some piece like, you know, oh, are you advocating war, you know, against right. Al-Qaeda? Well, you know, I mean, this is where Al-Qaeda was at the time. You know, they were orchestrating a plot from northern Pakistan against airliners. I mean, what are you going to do to go after them? And sort of, I think that that was the, I remember looking at that and saying, you know what, this is a, this is a turning point here. There's something's going to happen. Something's going to change now where the U.S. is going to have to go after these guys somehow because they can't just let these guys plot terrorist attacks against airliners from northern Pakistan. And of course, the Bush administration then started, I think, with what you're talking about, with started to ramp up the operation slowly in 2007, 2008. And then, of course, Obama comes in in 2009 and ramps it up even further. Is that, that am I getting that wrong or is that how you remember no, it as well? No, that, that's absolutely correct. So you had, you had the military operations by the Pakistani Taliban and, and al-Qaeda in Afghanistan while you had these plots emanating against the West from al-Qaeda and who, and this is why I was always interested in where, um, you know, where they were targeted, right? Because you could tell who controlled what areas. The Haqqani network, uh, Miram Shah, North Waziristan, uh, and South Waziristan, you know, that was the, the Mullah Nazir group, et cetera, et cetera. And you would see in these strikes, so the first one, it was interesting, right? The, you know, they killed a Pakistani Taliban commander fighting in Afghanistan, but then they killed an al-Qaeda leader in uh, inside of Afghanistan. Then, and then it was a mix, and you would, so... It really, as the term that you come up with, and I, I, I just love it, the, the, the wheel of jihad, that's what these drone strikes showed us. They showed the Pakistani Taliban supporting the Afghan Taliban while sheltering al-Qaeda and then the good Taliban or the Afghan Taliban, you know, all this whole thing. And then, and then you have and all these, these ethnic groups. You have the ethnic groups too. You had Uzbeks involved. You had yes. the Uyghurs. You had all these guys get scooped up in the drone campaign because they are all affiliated or working for al-Qaeda. And, you know, that's part of part of how we knew that the disconnect the dots methodology, as we called it, for understanding al-Qaeda was wrong. You know, there was this idea that it was bin Laden is not so merry men were holed up somewhere in Pakistan and everything else was sort of not really al-Qaeda. But you could see these relationships just through the drone campaign because, you know, they would target a senior al-Qaeda leader. and Oops, there's a, you know, a Turkestan Islamic Party guy is also in attendance or an Islamic movement of Uzbekistan guy is also in attendance or 
Pakistani Taliban or Haqqani or whatever, you know, and you could see that sort of um, cross fertilization between Al Qaeda and other groups through the drone data, through looking at who they're they're they're, they're targeting. But I want to say something about the drone data because you really pioneered this idea of accumulating data on this on the drone campaign. I think you were really were the first, uh, and that's not just because you're my colleague. I'm saying that I think you really I think you really were the the early early getter go getter on this topic. And I remember you describing it to me as a black box. And the reason you said it was a black box was because. The U.S. government wasn't putting out information saying, here's who we went after today, folks. No, they were. it was sort of delayed reporting at best. And a lot of times you had to rely on press reporting. You had to rely on what the jihadis were saying, their eulogies, uh, plus sources you developed doing this and covering the campaign bill. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, what you meant by the black box. I'm stealing your, your, your phrase here, which I always thought was great, but talk about what you meant by the black box in terms of reporting on this. Yeah, exactly. That's how I would describe it, is peering it. We're trying to peer into the black box, the darkness of, of the lawlessness and the you know the the tribal agencies of north and south waziristan where most of these strikes took place these are areas where the pakistani government exerted little if not and no zero control uh and they were fighting to you know to remove at the u.s behest again to to take out al-qaeda and jihadist groups that were threatening the west this is something that the pakistanis didn't want to do but they were sort of required to do um yeah so it very difficult as you mentioned press reporting um we relied on uh yeah i did i developed some confidential sources uh the statements from jihadists a lot of times it was really interesting the pakistani taliban um before even before they came the movement of the taliban in pakistan um, they would comment on these strikes, and you would see some interesting things. Like they would, uh, you would watch these reports. Uh, they were hopefully chatty. They were hopefully chatty at times. <sighs> yes, sure. extremely. Yeah. And yeah. and this was in part of the press reporting. And there were some good Pakistani journalists and good Pakistani press reporting at the time before the Pakistani military clamped down on, on them in the I'd say early to mid two thousand and tens. You would see these guys talking about it, and and. You know, so I'm going to bring up the, the issue of civilian casualties in this strike because here is the, typically the way you would see a report come out. You'd get a Pakistani Taliban commander or source who would say, yeah, they killed, you know, six of our guys and two Uzbeks and, a, and an Arab. And sometimes you might get a name or two out of this and they would tell you where it would happen. And then a half a day later, a day later, you'd say, oh, yeah, they killed a family of eight, you know, a, a wife, three children, an uncle and an aunt, because then they were trying to to conduct an information campaign to drive up the civilian casualties and play down. But so in a, in a rare instance, I think the, the first reports usually were the most accurate. You would get the more candid um, type of view. It is very difficult, though, to try and confirm these. Again, as you said, the U.S. military or the U.S. government is really most of the CIA at this point was conducting most of these operations, if not all of them. Um, we're not commenting on these unless a very senior leader was killed. Very rarely would you get any type of official, particularly early on, would you get official government confirmation. The Obama administration, which really wanted to play up the, the drone campaign as, as a winning strategy as opposed to just being a tactic or, as you and I have described it, as a tool in the toolbox, um, they would they would tout a lot more of these strikes. They'd be a little bit more chatty on these. So that was a little bit help more helpful as time went on in tracking these. And, you know, so you're tracking a covert campaign um, that was halfway in the open. It was I always found it ironic and, and very. Um, yeah, there's there's an inconsistency there, isn't there? I yeah. Mean, you can, I mean, well, that, because the, the missiles are the bombs, I mean, they're going to leave a mark, you know? I mean, you can't yeah. you can't cover up that something happened, you know, but you're not being, by the same token, they're not being fully transparent on exactly what it is that did happen. But let's stay on civilian casualties for just a second, because, sure. you know, this is a this is a minefield, as you know. So your, your point when tracking civilian casualties was, look, I'm going by what's in the publicly available sources. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what the civilian casualties were. Your figures on that were always higher than what the U.S. government was saying. And I remember, you know, there was something that John Brennan, who was the, I think he was the, first he was the counterterrorism advisor for President Obama. And then he becomes the CIA's, uh, the nominee to become CIA director. And as part of that process, when he's the nominee, I think it was in June of 2011, he said that there's not been a single collateral death in the covert U.S. drone strikes. 
you know, now this was this is an example of where, you know, I think we, as you just documented or just explained, some sources in the jihadi world or some other sort of nefarious characters, they sort of want to drive up the civilian casualty figure for their own purposes, their own information warfare. But here you had the uh, top Obama administration official making an equally implausible claim, even more implausible, saying that basically there was not a single collateral death, which we knew at the time. I remember you were tracking it. There was no way that was true. I mean, there's no way you have perfect pre- precision there on this. Right, Bill? I mean... E- that's correct, Tom. And, and so, look, the the reason that this tactic was developed was, A, to kill our enemies, and B, to limit c- civilian casualties. I think this is probably, I'm going to use a word that's contradictory, but probably the m- most humane air campaign that, that was developed in, in the history of U.S. military um, campaigns, obviously, again, driven by the CIA, but you get my point. Yeah, well, I mean, the idea and, is you could, you, you see, the U.S. could have sent B-52s yeah. over northern Pakistan and, and leveled villages, and thankfully they didn't do that. But this was, the idea here was to basically to try to develop a pinpoint way of going after, uh, you know, the bad guys without killing a lot of innocent men, uh, men, women, and children. And I think, you know, some of the critics of the campaign, and there are areas to criticize, of course, but some of the critics of the campaign were solely focused on the civilian casualties aspect, ignoring that this the idea was to try and limit them. And yeah. yes, you know, I mean, we should question what Brennan and, and all say and criticize them. But it, the whole point, as you say, was the whole idea was to limit civilian casualties. Yeah, and we were very critical at the time of those comments because, look, I mean, the reality is is it's impossible to fight a bloodless war. Civilian casualties will happen. There was evidence of civilian deaths whether the numbers that i've recorded or or others have recorded is is the number again i I always go back to we tried to peer into the black box and this truth is in there somewhere but it's certainly that number was never ever zero and it's it's very clear that jihadists and and again some people who just oppose u.s military or you know u.s counterterrorism operations inside pakistan would um attempt to drive up those civilian casualties and some people were you know, credulously reporting these um, these deaths. I saw this in particularly in Somalia and other theaters as well. Um, and it's you know, look, that's I think that's part of a, a, a an information campaign to really to just limit or end U.S. military operations anywhere. I mean, it's just that there's a certain anti-war sentiment out there to just the U.S. is the the cause of this problem. Uh, if we just left the jihadis alone, they'd leave us alone. Well, that just isn't true. Uh, you know, it, it the um, this campaign, it, it particularly in Pakistan, again, it was very, extremely difficult. We haven't recorded a strike since 2018. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not happening. It's just that the press reporting in Pakistan, that's really been locked down. So we don't know. And that's, it. you know, again, trying to gather all this information from public, from open sources, as well as what Al Qaeda and others, it was, it's an extremely difficult process. We don't pretend to be perfect. But one thing I do know is that certain, if the elements of U.S. military commands wanted to give a briefing on the U.S. drone campaign, say, in Pakistan or in Yemen or Somalia, they would often take our data and use it in an open source briefing, right? Because it's difficult to get everyone in a room to get everyone the same classification to need the, the private source. What I've been told is, hey, this is close enough to good to go that we can, you know, that we can use this to brief and and, and give information on trends. So I, I think to me that is a good indication of, you know, the, the, the work that we've done, how hard we've, you know, how how hard of a job we've done to to make this as accurate as possible. I don't pretend, you know, sometimes this is more of an art than a science. You you got to pick out the bad reports and you could you you learned how to to analyze information, what's good, what's bad. I mean, we've seen you know, one of the big challenges too, Tom was is um determining when a senior leader was killed or not in one of these strikes if it even happened and you know, it's a whole nother discussion, but that that is certainly a very challenging thing to do. And I think we've had an v- extremely good track record. I know I've gotten it wrong one or two. T- I can recall with Beitul and Masood, it was very difficult to determine whether the, he was the leader of the first leader of the movement of the Taliban in Pakistan. He's been, he was reported killed. Yeah, by, times. by the way, if I could say this to get this off my chest, right? There's some, I, I'm just going to use a cuss word. We don't usually cuss on this. There's some jackass who wrote some like review of your work at Wikipedia or something. Yeah, was, right, right. He was, right, yeah. was trying to pick out like, you know, the times you got it wrong on the drone campaign. I'm like, dude, come on. Are you out of your mind? You know, 
we're covering hundreds of these things. Bill's gotten it right time and time again. You know, usually the reports are caveated because we don't know. We're not yeah, sitting there. Exactly. We're not sitting there in Waziristan, you know. I mean, and, and, you know, somebody tried to accumulate sort of, you know, you know, controversies in reporting. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, yeah, I, I think mean, there yeah. there's like two or three of them. We have these and trolls. It's... We do have these trolls. And if you're listening, you can just hang up now. Just just, <laughs> just press the stop button, okay? Because we know who you are. We know generally who you are. And we don't care. Just go away, you know? I mean, you, you develop these people who don't really want to have a, sort of an honest debate or discussion about any of this. They just want to sort of snipe at you. And I don't really care. I don't have any time. I've got kids. I've got a life. We've got work to do. Go away, you know? But this, the, the people on this Wikipedia page, I remember this. I And I think you even try to get this... this this is, by the way, is one of the reasons why it's entirely personal and I don't care. I don't support the Wikipedia's mission is because I know you tried to get them to edit it to correct some of the stuff that was wrong yeah. about the reporting, and they just won't do it. I mean, it just, yeah. you know. There, there, there's, there's someone there process. harbors harbors yeah. a grudge. Like, you know, look, there's no mention of how right yeah. was I about Hockey Mullen Masood. I mean, Well, everyone... I mean, that was, you, that was the example I was going to use. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, you want to talk about Batula Masood. I mean, people don't even know. We're talking about these guys, and pe- most people don't even remember who we're talking about at this point, right? I mean, we could have yeah. just said, we could be saying Abu Shwarma, and nobody would even know what we're talking <laughs> exactly. about. Exactly. But Batula Masood <laughs> was an early sort of Pakistani Taliban you know, leader who you covered his campaign. He's still memorialized in the Pakistani Taliban press and media. Al Qaeda still memorializes him, by the way. Oh, by the way, um, you know he's still he's a guy who was very elusive. He was he was one of the guys you you talk about these guys being vampires, Bill. Right, where you, you unless you you know you stab a stake through their heart and cut off their head, and then you have a DNA sample, you can't confirm they're dead a lot of times. And this was one of those guys, right? I mean, you were tracking him. You know, he was. He was dead, then he was alive, then he was dead, then he was alive. He was sort of the the Mulbuk Mukhtar of uh, northern Pakistan. And I remember you were going back and forth. This. I remember we were having conversations about this. You're like, you know, I don't know. You're like, you know, people are saying he's dead, but he was dead yesterday or last week or last month, and then he pops back up. So anyway, he was one of these guys. But you got it right on Hakamul Masood, one of his his success, successors, who – and that was that was one of the weirdest moments in our career, really, was when Hakamul Masood sent that hat tip to you about the, Pac- the Pakistani Taliban's uh, bombing in, in Times Square in May 2010 because – that was sort of this weird thing where Bill got it right that Hakamu Mosud had survived at that point. He didn't ultimately survive. At that point, he had survived uh, the, the early attempts to kill him via drone. And he had one of his minions send Bill a, a, a video claiming responsibility for the May 2010 Times Square bombing, which was basically a hat tip to Bill's coverage of the drone campaign. It's just this bizarre universe, right? We got Hakamu Masood praising you. We got trolls trying to criticize you. It's just a total weird weirdness. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, and, and with him, like, and again, back getting back to the art and the science of this, I mean, he was killed in a drone strike. He was killed in an argument with um, – a competing, supposedly competing uh, uh, Pakistani Taliban leader who actually wound up being his deputy. And as we showed just a, a couple of uh, weeks ago when we published the report, those two were actually very chummy. You saw it in videos that the Taliban just released on that. Uh, he was killed in, in fighting. He was killed by his driver. He was killed by the Pakistani he military. Fell out. He, he slipped in the bathtub. He, yeah, there, exactly. there, are five, there are five million versions of this thing. I mean, you know, I mean, who, I mean the bottom line is until they – actually confirmed his death and we we knew for a fact he was dead it was it was very difficult to find out i meant that that was part of the big challenge in covering the drone campaign especially at its peak was that you know i mean let's, so let's, many reports tom just so yeah. many different and, strikes and we strikes every other day at some yeah. point and, and there and there were also there was also this wrinkle in it which was we subsequently came to learn from press reporting mainly that and we guessed this but it was subsequently confirmed that a lot of times or not a lot of times but some of the time the CIA or U.S. officials didn't necessarily know exactly who they were targeting, which added yeah. to the confusion. They were sort of signature strikes or they were based on algorithms yes. or sort of these ideas that you're going to sort of pool together data and figure out patterns of behavior and then and then place a strike based on that pattern of data. Now, I'm probably not describing it accurately because we've never actually seen how this this works. But the bottom line was it was sort of a, a sort of a... A, a reasoned sort of uh, approach to using drone strikes as opposed to an observational one. They basically used facts and evidence and accumulated. Like, and that that created problems for us in covering this as well, right, Bill? Yeah, that was. Yeah, the signature strikes was definitely something they were looking, like you said, patterns, people gathering at certain specific locations. And then obviously they're using intercepts and tips. There were actually, we had spies in, inside the, the area that would put, put uh, tracking devices and we would see the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and other groups talking about this and executing spies that they would catch. You would put the, I believe they called the Mukhtars. They were the, were the tracking devices. So yes, it definitely complicated and you had again you had a volume you know by in 2010 you had 117 strikes that's a strike every 
every third day. I mean, you know, and we don't know, we didn't know, you know, again, they're not talking about who was being targeted. A lot of these people, you know, so it, it look, it was, it, it was extremely effective. I, you know, it was, it was funny. You didn't really know what you were getting. It was like uh, striking the pinata and seeing what the candy came out. You know, that's basically what was happening in, um, in North, in South Waziristan. Well, I just, I just, I've never, I've never heard, that's a new one for me. I've never heard <laughs> an Al Qaeda meeting or gathering or Al Qaeda plus described as a pinata in which the CIA is striking to figure out which candy falls out. That's pretty good. I mean, yeah, can, right. You get some yeah, Snickers, you get some, yeah. you know, M&Ms, yeah, you get, the, you you get, get the, all okay. kinds of flavors. Yeah, you get and that's the really, pieces, it's pretty good. You know, you, you get really, you, I mean, and this is what happened. You'd find out there was a Haqqani network leader there. There was a, 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 a I guess, I guess, the, I guess in that, in that analogy, I guess the Lashkari Janjvi guys would be like the Fruit Loops or something. Like they'd be the, <laughs> exactly. Because of the, yeah. of the Actually, rabbit, an, the rabbit anti-Shiites, you know, the, the, the craziest of the crazies within the, and, and now, ISIS definitely, you know, you, you would get some colorful, colorful I, candy out of those. I really think it would just all be bad candy, to be honest with you. Um, we, yeah, we actually, can, we shouldn't so, use we shouldn't use good brand name candy. Yeah, that's, exactly. a good, that's a good point. We should use, like, the cheap <laughs> stuff. Like, you know, the stuff we get at, like, the county fair, like some, you know, right. some yeah. crappy, like, penny candy or something. Some dots. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. Things like that, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and this would, you would see this. You would see, we got two Haqqani network leaders. We would... We got uh, the Islamic movement, Uzbekistan fighter. We got a, uh, you know, Turkestan Islamic party. We got Al Qaeda. We got, you know, you got. Um, you'd even see uh, Kashmiri jihadists pop up in some of these strikes. I remember. No, one of no, no, was, Bill. They're they're purely nationalists. Remember, uh, that's purely, purely nationalists. nationalists. Yeah, but right, that's why they were okay. in North and right. South Waziristan at the time, right, right. right? So you would, you would, you would, and you know, again, it was. The program, it was just very interesting to see what was happening. I always wish I could have been, I've been in actual um, tactical operation centers in in, Af- in Iraq where they were doing some targeting of Al-Qaeda and Iraq leaders during the surge, for instance, right? So I've seen how that looks and how that works, but that was very specific, very localized. And, you know, we had good sources and presence. I really wish I could have been in the room of one of these, uh, you know, in the CIA operation centers when these strikes were going off and seeing how they were gathering the information and who they thought they got. And it's just fascinating. And we have a list uh, at the Long War Journal of HV high value targets killed. That list is really, really long. It, this is just for Pakistan. There's a lot of, and, and again, it's not just Al Qaeda. It's a host. It, it, it's a host of jihadist groups. It really demonstrates that wheel of jihad because you see Afghan Taliban leaders, Pakistani Taliban leaders, um, unaffiliated Taliban leaders in in um, in Pakistan, you know, and, and then the host of groups, and it just showed how they were all interacting together and, so, and working together. Yeah. So one of, one of the big um, early on big gets for the drone campaign was Mustafa Yazid, and you'll remember him. Yes. He w- he was a you know also known as Sayyid al Masri. Of course, he was Egyptian. He's a guy who worked closely for Bin Laden. He was basically Bin Laden's aide de camp, general manager. It's tough to describe. You know, chief financier. Chief he played, financial officer. Yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, he played he played, he played a number of these different roles, and they got him. I think it was in May 2010. And I I, I remember that when we got the when the Bin Laden files released, the files were covered from Bin Laden's compound. I remember you and I talked about one of the files that was we saw very quickly was the Taliban's glowing eulogy for for Sayyid al-Masri, Mustafa Yazid. You know, it was it was a good example of where the Taliban made sure to send this statement to bin Laden and al-Qaeda hierarchy to say, you know, this is this was a, you know, a glorious fighter here for the jihad in Afghanistan. And it was a good example of where what the Taliban was saying publicly at the time, you know, where they're not really advertising any, at that point in time, any real ties to al-Qaeda on a day-to-day basis. I mean, you have some commanders you know, popping off and telling the truth. But a lot of times they're not explaining the whole situation. Here you have a, a file that tells exactly what they really do think about Bin Laden's right-hand man, really. Um, yeah, and and he, um, look, his ties to the Afghan Taliban were no secret. That was also one of his key jobs was he was basically the liaison. I believe it was Al-Qaeda's commander don't tell, in Afghanistan. Don't tell Zalmay Khalilazad this, Bill. This is right. Not, don't tell Secretary Pompeo this. This can't be. This can't yeah. be, you know. He— he was Al Qaeda's leader in Afghanistan when he was killed, and he was a key Al Qaeda's key liaison. They respected him. There's even picture a picture out there with him meeting with uh, Afghan Taliban leaders, and there's some, some menacing Al Qaeda jihadists with the masked and you know and the white headband around the head and toting AKs. So, yeah, I mean he's the perfect example of 
who we were targeting, who were we going after the, at the time. So it was, you know, and again, it, it was the plots against the West, but it was also Al-Qaeda's operations in Afghanistan. It was this dual, you know, it, it wasn't just one thing. We would often go after Haqqani network leaders. It, it, it appeared that because in some of these strikes, it was just Haqqani leaders and, and Haqqani network, of course, is an uh, integral part of the Taliban. It's deputy Amir. Um, I'm sorry, the Haqqani network's Amir, uh, Siraj Siraj Haqqani. He is the uh, deputy Amir of the Afghan Taliban. So there's make no mistake, they it is a, a part of the Afghan Taliban. But there were times where they just went after Haqqani operatives in uh, North Waziristan, and the reason for that was they were fighting in Afghanistan, they were dangerous there, but they were also sheltering Al-Qaeda inside North Waziristan, so you had that duality of, for, the, for the strikes, it was, it, it fulfilled both roles. Yeah, I mean, that, that's part part of the problem here, right, in defining all this, was the idea was to suppress threats against the West originally through the drone campaign, but, you know, oftentimes these guys are playing more than one role, they're not just, not just plotting against the U.S., they have other other jobs that you know sort of in their sort of portfolio we've seen that time and time again now now uh, Mustafa Yazid's successor was a T. Abdel Rahman a, Li- a Libyan who was very close to bin Laden and we know that from the bin Laden files he was basically we're going to do a whole episode on the bin Laden files at some point maybe a couple episodes but um, a T. Abdel Rahman was basically the chief sort of conduit for contacts for bin Laden in the outside world and from mid-2010, right up to bin Laden's death in 2011, May 2011, you know, uh, Atiyah Abdel Rahman is the main guy that, that bin Laden is going through to get his correspondence from al-Qaeda lieutenants around the world, discussing strategy, discussing tactics, discussing theological issues, all sorts of uh, things that uh, Rahman was, was tasked with dealing with. Now, there was one memo in particular. There's a couple things we'd like to talk about here. One of the things that Bill and I have been critical of, and you, you, I think you were probably critical of this before I was in, in, in pointing this out, was that the drone campaign is successful tactically to a degree, but it's not a strategy. That it's not a strategy for defeating these organizations, and maybe there is no strategy at this point for defeating them, quite frankly, after all these years, given the, the lack of political and, and other will to, to, to fight them. Um, but there was one memo from Atiyah al Rahman, right in the height of the drone campaign in 2010, mid-2010, where he's describing what al-Qaeda looks like at the time. And he describes their operations as being at a medium tempo. And I remember you and I were looking at that and we're thinking, well, that's interesting, isn't it? They're at a medium tempo right at the peak of the drone campaign. This is Al-Qaeda senior leadership describing it. And what does that mean? Well, it's not a low tempo, is it? So it's not it's not death. They're not dead. And it's not a high tempo, sure. But it's sort of not, they're, you know, you could see Rahman, Atiyah Abdul Rahman is complaining about the drones, for sure. You could point to all sorts of files where he's complaining about it and the effect his predecessor is killed in one such drone strike. There's all sorts of evidence that the drones got baddies and did damage to them, for sure. But when they take a step back and look at the whole thing, they're not saying this is the death knell of the end is nigh at that point in time. They're saying that essentially, you know, this has hurt their operations, but they're still at a medium tempo. And maybe, Bill, it's worth spending just a second talking about your initial critiques of why, you know, you you term this a tactical successes, but not strategic success. Yeah, right. And Tom, as we've always said, it, it's it, this, this drone campaign, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to defeat the group, right? And and I think what happened in Pakistan um, really demonstrates this. Um, and you know, I'm going to just step back. You know, you said there's no strategy to, to defeat them. I, I would argue there's no no strategy we're willing to pursue to defeat well, that's them. What that's, a, that's what I meant. That's what I Of course, no, there's no political will. There's no political will or other right. will to, to yep, come up with that. Exactly. Yeah, I correct. just wanted to be clear on that. And yeah. so, yeah, they're at a medium tempo because look, they the jihadists. So 95% of these strikes, and again, I, I always focused on the where, where they occurred, who they targeted, who controlled the territory. Those were always important factors for me. A lot of other people focused on the civilian casualties, but those to me were three key indicators and who else was killed. Um, those were the key indicators because I, I wanted to understand that's what their network looks like. That's what tells us who's supporting who. And so 95% of these strikes took place in North Waziristan. And you'd get an occasional strike to stray out in like Orkazai or Khyber or another place. But so the, the, the U.S. basically agreed with the, the Pakistani military that they would focus on targeting, Al, targeting Al-Qaeda in, um, in North and South Waziristan. This was basically the tip of the spear of, of Al-Qaeda's operations inside of Afghanistan. I'm sorry, for, to, that projected into Afghanistan. And so you had a lot of senior leaders and military commanders, and that's a lot of who were killed in these strikes, um, bomb makers, things of that nature. But 
so the big problem is, is Al Qaeda wasn't just confined to North and South Waziristan. So while we were focusing all our energy there, Al Qaeda has a presence in Karachi and Quetta and Islamabad. You know, take your pick your Pakistani city, and that's in the and Bin Laden files too. I mean, they're talking about faci- they're talking about facilitators in different areas where Bin Laden is talking about moving his son. You know, Hamza at the time, or other yep. family members, and he's talking about move him about, to Peshawar, right? Yeah, right. yeah, they got they got all sorts of facilitators. All and and you know, basically, one of the big things going forward here is nobody has a clear picture of what that looks like today in Pakistan in terms of the extent right. of the network. You know, nobody does. But go ahead. Yeah, I don't so, know. so while they're yeah, while the operations, Al Qaeda's operations were medium, they had to in in those areas they had to focus on survival a lot. They talked about this in in the files, and you'll see they released statements on how to evade drones publicly and things. And they would they would you know so it was clear that it was affecting them, but it didn't go down to low operations because that wasn't just where Al Qaeda was confined. So yes, it hurt them. It took out some key. It took out a lot of key leaders. It took out a lot of key facilitators and bomb makers. But it didn't take out all of them. I mean, look, it, we're 19 years, uh, coming on 19 years after 9-11, and Ayman al-Zawahiri is still alive. Where was Osama bin Laden um, killed in a raid? He was killed far, well, pretty far from north and south Waziristan in Abbottabad, a, a Pakistani city in the north, what was then the northwest frontier province. So... You know, we have a lot of evidence that Al Qaeda wasn't just based in North and South Waziristan, and that's why their tempo wasn't minimal or low. That's why it went to medium. They they had problems, yes. And this again, remember, two thousand and ten, late two thousand and ten, when these letters were coming out, um, this was at the height of the U.S. drone campaign. So, I've always found that to be interesting. And you know, the Bin Laden files gave us a, a very fascinating look into how Al Qaeda perceived. The, th- the the drone threat and um and how it reacted to it as well. You know, it's around the, the topic of the Bin Laden files. As we were preparing for this podcast, I this episode of the podcast, I looked up uh, one of my my old favorites. It was this uh, speech that President Obama gave in May 2013, and he was eager to trumpet the effic- efficacy of the drone campaign. And look, he you know he had a point there. The CIA did some amazing work in tracking down senior Al Qaeda leaders and others. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely tapped down on uh, big international plots. We can, you, you know, the list you mentioned earlier, Bill, the Long War Journal, there's a whole list of guys who were killed in, the, in these strikes who were clearly senior, well, you know, veteran terrorists, guys who threatened the world for sure. But, you know, there was a, always a tendency to oversell the efficacy of the drone campaign, too. And I was looking back at the speech that, that Obama gave in May 2013, and he was eager to quote Bin Laden. And I remember I read this at the time and I was struck by the fact that we were the only ones that realized he had selectively cited Bin Laden. Because during that speech, Obama says, uh, you know, and I'm going to quote, this is a quote now from President Obama. To begin with, our actions are effective. Don't take my word for it. In the intelligence gathered at Bin Laden's compound, we found that he wrote, meaning Bin Laden wrote, quote, this is now Obama quoting Bin Laden, saying, we could lose the reserves to enemies' airstrikes. We cannot fight airstrikes with explosives. And so that was the quote. We could lose the reserves to enemies' airstrikes. We cannot fight airstrikes with explosives that President Obama used from Bin Laden's own pen to show that the drone strikes were effective because basically he was worried about losing the reserves. But I remember, Bill, we were going through this and going through these files, and you go through the file that that was taken from, the speechwriter or whoever took that for, for President Obama and put, put that there, and they clearly cherry-picked those lines. Uh, because the rest of the quote uh, is all about how they're not going to put the reserves in harm's way. And basically, we're, we're going to put just enough uh, forward to fight the Americans and others, but we're not going to lose everybody. And basically, we're going we're gonna to move personnel around to make sure that we're not going to ha- lose everybody. And so here's the full quote from Bin Laden. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know this is always tough reading a quote on a podcast, but I'm going to give you the full quote, and I'm going to isolate then the phrase that Obama or Obama's team picked out of it. So the full quote from Bin Laden, this is in Bin Laden's files, was, the UMA should put forward some, but enough, forces to fight America. The UMA must keep some of its forces on reserve. This will be in the UMA's best interests. The UMA will use the reserve in the future, but during the appropriate time. In the meantime, we do not want to send the reserves to the front line, especially in areas where the enemy only uses airstrikes to attack our forces. So the reserves will not, for the most part, be effective in such conflicts. Basically, and this is the part now that Obama's team quoted, basically, Bin Laden wrote, we could lose the reserves to enemies' airstrikes. We cannot fight airstrikes with explosives. Now, wait a minute. 
look at the full quote when he said, you know, Bin Laden is saying we're going to move the reserves uh, out of the front line. We're going to keep them away from the areas where they could be droned to death. You know, he's speaking on behalf of the Ummah, the entire community of worldwide Muslims, which, of course, Bin Laden never did. So, you know, this is his own grandiose vision of himself. But yeah, he's talking about how the Ummah is going to put forth these reserves, but only some of them and the rest of them they're going to keep to the side, make sure they're not in the, kill, the drone kill box, as you used to describe it, Bill. Now, we looked at other files, and Bill, you'll remember this, and you could see that Bin Laden used this advice and he put it into practice. What did he do? He ordered his guys to move personnel out of North Pakistan, northern Pakistan back into Afghanistan. Yeah, and so it, in one file, uh, I believe it was from October 2010, he um, he ordered al-Qaeda operatives to re- relocate as many quote-unquote brothers um, to Nuristan, Kunar, Ghazni, and Zabul provinces. He viewed these as being favorable terrain there, um, for al-Qaeda. There's a lot of um, support for um, al-Qaeda from the, the, the Afghan Taliban. Um, what we do know, though, it wasn't just these areas that Al Qaeda relocated um, to. Um, in another letter, I believe Bin Laden tells uh, Atiyah Abdul Al Rahman, who was Al Qaeda's general manager at the time. I think this letter was, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, in December 2003. And this is, I'm going to quote uh, again. Not goes, 2003, we later. I'm not. sorry, yeah. 2010. Yeah, 2010, December yeah, 2010. Right. Yeah. Yep. He says, I insist on the brothers quickly leaving Waziristan for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And they should enter Afghanistan in small quote, small groups. End quote. So he's telling them to to leave Waziristan for Pakistan, not just Afghanistan. I always yeah. found that to be a, a very interesting. So and look, we saw direct evidence of this uh, after these orders were given. We started to see Al Qaeda leaders start being killed inside of senior Al Qaeda leaders uh, being killed inside of Afghanistan. Uh, Farouk Al Qatani is one of them, right? Um, he was ta- he was one of the Al Qaeda leaders who was tasked with moving um, Al Qaeda fa- um, Al Qaeda operatives and their families. Also, their families were being moved into Afghanistan as well, which tells you how they felt about their comfort level, right? Um, he was killed in a U.S. Uh, airstrike in 2016. Uh, yeah, just days and before the presidential election that year. And in and, ex- ex- and that exactly. presidential election, I always, I always, this goes to show how the political discourse is really not tied into these things anymore because during the 2016 presidential election, there was not a single word about Al-Qaeda or almost nothing. Yeah. I don't want to say not a single word, but almost nothing about Al-Qaeda. And there certainly there was no mention of the fact that Farouk Al-Qahtani, the senior Al-Qaeda leader who was reporting, who had reported in the past directly to bin Laden, who was reporting directly to Ayman al-Zawahiri, who established safe havens in Kunar and Nuristan for Al-Qaeda, who had a battalion that he led for many seasons, according to one file written by Atiyah Abdel Rahman. Um, there was no mention. I mean, it was days before the presidential election. And this sort of wasn't even a blimp on the radar. You know, nobody, sort of everybody had moved on from this. And that went to show that sort of that there's not really been any focus on these issues for many years, you know? Yeah. And, and let's face it, Farouk al Qatani doesn't go into Al into Afghanistan, command Al Qaeda battalions. By the time of his death, he was described as both Al Qaeda's military leader in Afghanistan as well as Al Qaeda's overall leader in Afghanistan. Yeah, and he was so working. He was working with the Taliban led insurgency in eastern Afghanistan yep. against their common foes. I mean, this is and he was he was another one of these dual hatted guys, right? I mean, he's he's yep. leading insurgency or helping to lead the insurgency in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the U.S. intelligence, the U.S. military implicate him in plots against the West and the direct hand in al-Qaeda's external operations. Well, isn't that an inconvenient set of facts for the negotiating team in Doha? It it sure is. And another guy, uh, I'll just mention one more, Abu Khalil al-Sudani. He was a top al-Qaeda leader. Um, He's mentioned in the bin Laden files. He was actually proposed to be Atiyah Abdul al-Rahman's deputy, at one point in time, so that was discussed. It's never it, we we didn't get enough information to no, know because Bin Laden was killed. Um, you know this the, whether he actually took up that position, but he was killed in a U.S. raid in 2015. That appears to be a ground uh, raid. Um, but uh, but um, you know he was killed in Paktika province, right? This is one of the problems that wasn't mentioned. And by the way, the information that was obtained during that raid, as far as I can tell, and from what I hear from my sources. That, that was that information that led to the raid uh, in Shorabak in Kandahar province where there were two large al-Qaeda training camps. Um, the U.S. attacked those several months later. The U.S. had no idea that these camps existed until they conducted this raid and killed um, killed Sudani and, and gathered information. So it just shows, you know, again, we're peering into the black box again, and the, the military is trying to peer into the black box as well. But, that, you know, look, that's, that's, and that's just a, a sliver of the evidence of how we know al-Qaeda was willing to send its operatives inside of Afghanistan to take shelter. Um, from 
U.S. Uh, the U.S. drone campaign. And think about that. The U.S. military has a presence in Afghanistan and still does to this day. And in, it has intelligence assets and it's working with the Afghan military. And yet Al Qaeda still felt that it was important to send its leaders into Afghanistan, not just into Pakistan, but into Afghanistan as well. Yeah. Now, of course, the drone campaign over time, it sort of, I mean, it starts in Yemen, uh, you know, and then basically proliferates, you know, back to South Asia. Uh, and then it comes back to Yemen, starts ratcheting up in Yemen again, but also elsewhere. The drones start being used in a number of different theaters. And I remember we started covering, you know, the drone campaign against Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which was reconstituted in early 2009. And over time, I think the U.S., the CIA, with probably help from the Saudis, according to press reports and others, developed some pretty darn good intelligence on AQAP senior leadership and starts hunting them down, uh, starts taking them out. And it leads to this campaign in 2015 where Nasr al wahashi who was formerly the uh, aide de camp to Osama bin Laden, gets killed in June 2015. But th- at least three of his senior lieutenants, including two ideologues, and some others are taken out in this campaign as well. It's a pretty effective decapitation strike against a- strikes against AQAP. However, they, re- they replaced these guys, of course, with others who were waiting in the wings. And it sort of speaks to sort of becomes murky, right, Bill, in figuring out how much of an effect these have on the overall operations for the organizations. I mean, Nazar al wahashi was a big get. I mean, yes. know, they, they got him. I mean, that's a, you know, he's somebody who at that point in time, he's uh, helping to coordinate al-Qaeda's efforts to counter the rise of the Islamic State or ISIS. He rejects the ISIS caliphate claim. He's somebody who personally worked for bin Laden, so he has that street cred in the jihadi world. Um, he's somebody who was, who was considered an authoritative and clever and smart figure, uh, in terms of being able to lead, and they, and they get him, I and mean, this is a big get for him. Um, but overall, and I, that's certainly these types of operations. You can point to uh, I should have, I shouldn't have skipped over this. You could point to a drone strike that killed. I think it was a drone strike killed Anwar al all the way back in September 2011. You know, Alaki was a guy who was clearly not just involved in inspiring plots in the West, but he was a guy who was involved in had a direct hand in plots against the West. So you could point to all these drone strikes. And they clearly are suppressing the level of threat. They're clearly disrupting the chain of command at times, probably inter- you know, causing problems with the communications. Um, they have all sorts of other effects that we can't really even get a handle on a lot of times. But overall, we can't figure out you know, how, how, how damaging is it really to the organization overall. And that's where we're talking about the media tempo file from Atiyah del Rahman. But then AQAP, right, Bill? We've documented how AQAP replaced its leadership are they as effective as Nazar al Haishi? Probably not. Qasem al Raimi, whose replacement was killed in January of this year. Um, they've lost some other guys as well. But here's an indication of, of on, on the plus side for the drone campaign, how effective they are. AQAP has released a series of videos complaining about it, right? The espionage. And you, you talked earlier about the tracking devices, Bill. And I, I don't really understand all this, and I don't know exactly how it works. But basically, you know, you could see AQAP thinks that. Saudi and American and British spies have infiltrated their ranks. They're complaining about it all the time. And that they're putting these tracking devices in cars and other th- other areas and are betraying their brethren, betraying AQAP leaders. That's a pretty big deal. What do you think about the actual technology of that, the aspect of that bill, and what's how that's evolved over time? Yeah, they're, they're um, you know, I don't see a lot of reports of this now, which makes me think that it's probably they, they they probably reestablish the, the jihadist groups have established their their counterintelligence um because i just don't see it like i used to i mean you, you'll see reports now and then um i think they you know the truth lies somewhere in the middle the definitely you would get individuals either within the group or outside the group to place tracking devices they were often described as like the size of a pack of cigarettes and so i imagine you know look we 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 don't really know what the technology the cia and the u.s military is using um but that sounds about right and they would usually put them on a car because a lot of these strikes would or put them um outside of a home that they felt where a senior leader or or wanted jihadists would be um located and then the strike would follow up and you know We've seen in Somalia, in in Yemen, and in Pakistan. That's it's been a hot issue um, for them, and they've they've really it's been one of the um, uh, should I say uh, you know a big focus of theirs is their their counterintelligence in order to to stop this sort of thing from happening. I'm gonna want to make one quick point about Alaki. Um, his also his son was killed uh, um, in a drone strike. He was a 16 year old, yeah. right? Yeah. And there was a lot of criticism from you know we killed a child in a drone strike. 
Um, look, you don't travel to Yemen in t- at this point in time um, and, uh, you know, think that everything's fine. You know, it's like, oh, well, he just wanted to go attend, um, learn how to speak Arabic. Well, look, the reality is, is AQAP eulogized him. They called him a lion of the jihad and things. He was there to wage jihad. Controversy over killing an American citizen who's a teenager? Sure. But let's not lose sight over, you know, was he a civilian? Is, you know, Betul Masood, you know, the Pakistani Taliban leader, his wife, his uncle, and a couple of his children were killed in the strike. Look, the reality is, is, I mean, would we have been crying if, uh, you know, uh, Hitler's wife, if Ava Braun was killed in a, or Goebbels family was killed in a U.S. airstrike in, in Berlin in 1945? I always found this to be a little bit, uh, you know, you know, using, using these type of incidents, uh, sorry to turn back to the civilian strike thing. I just thought it was the perfect place here since you mentioned Milwaukee, but you know, using that as, as, a uh, you know, it, it's funny they, they even even AQAP tried to say, oh, he was a civilian and he was just a child. And yet they lionize him as a, as a you know, they eulogize him as a lion of jihad. So you always see a lot of discrepancies there. But those who are critical of American operations really, I think, are being disingenuous in cases like that. Well, I, I would add a couple things to that. One, I mean, I, I'm always careful. I don't want to um, assume that the sins of the father fall on the, the daughter or sons, you know? So, you know, Amor al clearly is a terrorist. He's somebody who's clearly threatened the U.S. I don't want to assume that, that any of that guilt is on his son. Definitely not. And, of course, he lost a, do- a daughter in a counterterrorism raid. al did years after al was yes. killed. You know, a little girl was killed in the counterterrorism raid. Right. Um, you know, and I, mean, I remember AKP putting up the pictures of it. It is heartbreaking to look at that little girl with a bow in her hair thinking she was killed in this raid, for sure. You know, I mean, it's effective even on somebody who's not really... Uh, all that uh, emotional about this stuff. I, I look at this very logically, but you know, you could see, you know, that that's a that's a problem, you know. But the issue too on the other on the other side of that, the issue too is that these guys don't, um, you know, they don't stand up and fight like regular warriors, right? They're embedded in civilian areas. They're embedded with their families. They're plotting terror while they're embedded with their families, and that sort of creates the problem, right? That basically, how are you going to go get on Warlocky with, uh, you know, how are you going to, unless he's single riding on a motorcycle and you're able to drone him, which has happened sometimes, We've got, you know, the U.S. has gotten guys like that, unless he's doing that, it's going to be very difficult to isolate him and kill him and get him. Now, of course, some on the left would say, well, you know, he should be brought to America and tried, but he wasn't turning himself in. And if you're going to, if you're going to send American forces into Yemen to go get him, that's going to in- introduce all sorts of other problems, right? Part of the, the advantage of the drones, you avoid sort of messy sort of special operations raids in, in areas where it's problematic. That, in fact, as I mentioned, Al-Laki lost a daughter in such raid in, I think it was early 2017. And, you know, that was that was a special forces raid. You know, so this is a this is a complex topic. I do think people trying to distill it down. I think what you're yeah. getting at, Bill, is the people trying to distill it down to say, well, his son was killed. Yeah, you know, I'm not looking, I, I'm not looking to advocate for killing Anwar al son at all. Um, but, you know, this is a war. And the problem is that this, this basically becomes you know, very difficult to kill a Lockheed by himself. And there's great effort made to do that. And, you know, I was thinking about this too and how those efforts have evolved over time. And I'll give you one example because we were talking about the technology, everything else, you know, in, I think it was in early 2017, we saw, and we, I should have written it up at the time, but I, I didn't write it up this way. Um, we saw that one of Ayman al-Zawahiri's chief lieutenants, this guy, Abu Karel Mazri, was one of the senior al-Qaeda leaders. He was killed in Idlib province in Syria with a new type of drone missile. And it was been described in the press. I think it's described as sort of a variant of the Hellfire missile. I think it's been termed the R the R9X, I think is right. And basically we we know we saw the footage of this car where Abu Karel Mazri was killed. We had the pictures of that. And it was very, very precise, but it was also very strange. Basically this missile came through the top of the car and killed him and didn't kill other people in the car apparently. And so subsequently, it comes out that what it was is that this R9X is basically a specially designed missile that has blades that come out of it, and the blades start spinning right before impact and basically shred their target. I mean, that is, you know, quite a uh, improvisation on the original drone idea. You know, that's quite a, quite an evolution. But it goes to show, it goes back to the idea that the U.S. has, I mean, yes, there's mistakes to criticize for sure, and people should criticize them, but the U.S. has developed technology and gone out of its way to try and avoid, to this degree, civilian casualties and incidental casualties in this type of warfare, right, Bill? 
Yeah, and, and look, this is this was a timely report. I believe it came out yesterday, or if not this morning. Um, the U.S. military said it killed, I believe it was like 113 civilians in Afghanistan, Somalia, and Syria in airstrikes, right? That's what it, it, it did its tally. It's doing its best to, you know, provide transparency. Well, maybe that number's doubled. I think that's three countries where you're in a very hot war. Um, using, you know, again, while trying to peer through the, the black box. Um, so, you know, and people will say that's horrible number. People that say that have no perspective on, on, on warfare and, and understanding how these, as you said, how these groups fight, how they, they, they're not fighting. They're not in uniform. They're not on the battlefield. They're not on a front line. They're conducting meetings in homes with their families presence. They're traveling with their families present. It's, you know, so yeah, I it, it I, I I sort of I'm mystified by this, but you know people that think that the you can have a bloodless war that the the civilian casualty count can be zero, they just have no understanding of what warfare is. I think the U.S. military, the CIA, has done their best to to keep that number as close to zero as possible, but that's an impossible task, and anyone who wants that um, or, or insists on that really is um isn't isn't doing so not out of an understanding of of warfare and the nature of the enemy we fight but just out of i in my opinion you know anti-war and anti-american sentiments yeah i mean the Iraqi stuff i mean there was somebody i mean there was there was i think there's been all sorts of ridiculous things uh printed about Iraqi. i mean it you know there was even one analyst who was challenging whether or not he was even involved in and you know applying terrorism against the u.s and i'm th- looking at that and i'm thinking dude all you got to do is read what he's saying, right? And he's saying it out there. He's telling you he's plotting against the U.S. This isn't take, this isn't rocket science, right? I don't need some sort of forensic accounting of Anwar al movements to know that this guy is plotting yeah. terrorism against the U.S. He's proud of it. He's you know he's quite proud of it. And he, he launched a whole publication to inspire such acts of terrorism. And then, by the way, we have a whole series of court records saying that he's plotting, you know, had a direct hand in sort of using this early innovator and using digital technology and digital communications and cryptic communications to conspire with Al Qaeda terrorists who were plotting in the UK or elsewhere, uh, you know, I mean, there's a there's a very well documented track record on that. And you know, again, you can you could point to the death of his son and say, okay, look, that's not not a goal certainly of the program, and maybe it's lamentable, although it's a little bit murky. But it was not the uh, you know the whole point is that this is a guy who clearly had to come in the crosshairs. Yeah, I, I mean, look, and, and on the issue of his son, he was targeted. In a strike that actually targeted AQAP's media Amir, so I mean, he wasn't like he was hanging out with good people. Um, for, I'm talking about Awaki's son. Look, one of my biggest complaints, and this is a you know another topic entirely, but someone like Anwar al Awaki wasn't charged with treason. I mean, his actions, you know, on behalf of Al Qaeda, um, his very public statements, he. Him, he he provided the own evidence for his guilt of treason and why he wasn't charged and tried as 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 a traitor, which would have allowed us to just kill him without any remorse, is beyond me. But the you know look the the lawfare aspect of all this, I, I well you know on that, on that point, I mean Samir Khan, who was his colleague, I think it was Samir absolutely Khan, yeah. another, Ameri- another, another Ameri- American, American, yeah, yeah, he actually wrote an article saying I'm proud to be a traitor, right? And yet we have this sort of tortuous logic here in the u.s where we can't call a traitor a traitor you know yeah uh, it's, no it's, it's really bizarre it's, i mean he, li- he literally wrote an article saying i am a traitor or proud of my treason you know uh, you know but you know there's another american too who was killed i think he was killed in the drone strike wasn't adam gadon killed in the drone strike i think he was yeah it's unclear how he was, he killed. was killed we yeah, never we yeah. But uh, yes, he was. And it's, it's unclear if he was killed in Afghanistan. I mean, Adam Gadan, I mean, another one, sh- I mean, clearly should have been charged with treason. Yeah, now, I, think, according- I think he was killed in the drone strike and with zero stands, right? I think I, he was killed. I, yeah. I the reports are, yeah. Yeah. So, but, um, but he's an American. He's an American from California. Yeah. And just to your point, he was never charged with treason, even though he is featured in videos on behalf of, of speaking for Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri and Al-Qaeda senior leadership. He's somebody who is speaking on their behalf quite openly and loudly and advocating their cause against his former country. Yeah, I mean, look, if that isn't traitorous behavior, I, I don't know what is. I mean, look, this is what a, 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 a Yemeni journalist said that, um, who was with him, said that um, Anwar al son, Abdul Rahman, said, I, he said, I hope to attain martyrdom as my father attained it. Um, that's what, you know, that's what we're dealing with there. So, you know, again, I don't, you know, yes, the, the, the young daughter of Anwar Awaki, I mean, that's tragic. And again, civilian casualties happen, 
But, you know, look, we're dealing, you know, in the case of the Awakis, I mean, we're still killing um, Awakis in Yemen in airstrikes. Um, that's a that's a family with a really bad history of jihad. So, you know, I mean, where we stand today in the drone campaign? I mean, it's definitely, you can see that there's, you know, other countries have sporadically used drones in, in warfare. I mean, the, the UK, I mean, the British, I think it was in 2015, they went after Riyadh Khan, who was one of the these ISIS virtual plotters. He's a guy who was involved in planning attacks in the UK. Riyadh Khan is fascinating. I'm almost thinking about doing a podcast just on him or people like him at some yeah, point. Because yeah. he, was, he was very prolific on using the online world to instigate terror on, on the behalf of ISIS. He was the first, according to the British Parliament, he was the first. It was the first time the UK, outside of like a war, a battle, basically, or some sort of uh, war fighting, had an individual targeted drone strike to go after him, to go after and kill him. Um, you know, and so you see some migration of this to other sort of American allies, and I think it's going to migrate even still further. And of course, drones were then used, smaller drones, not anywhere near what we're talking about with Hellfires or Predators or anything like that, but much smaller drones. Commercial style drones have been adapted by the jihadis in their own war fighting. We saw that in Mosul. We've seen that in elsewhere. We've seen, you know, this uh, uh, Jund al Aqsa, which was this Al Qaeda affiliated group in Syria, was, you know, dropping small ordnance from uh, smaller, smaller drones. So you're seeing some migration in that in that regard. But where do we where do we stand? Just not, those are all broad topics. But where do we stand today in terms of the U.S. campaign, drug campaign, Bill? Where would you say it is now in terms of if you just give like a quick review of where it is in terms of outside the war zones? Where is yeah, it Pakistan, right, and, and you know. And that's the interesting thing about Syria, right? Like, because it's sort of a, you know, the coalition to defeat the, the Islamic State, right? But yes, Britain's willingness to go after one, I believe he was one of the Beatles, right? Um, uh, no, he right? was not one of the Beatles. No. He was not? Oh, okay. No, no, okay. no, no, no he, was, he, was, he was one of the virtual plotters. He was that's a guy, right, okay. He was, he, was oh. a guy, he was a guy who was involved in, he, he basically um, used the charismatic online presence to woo people to his cause and was get and was and it sped up the, what's known as the radicalization curve well, that's the whole problematic topic for another time but go ahead yeah so and i always found isis's use of drones in mosul that was just stunning video and they would release those grenades and whatnot were taking out tanks i mean taking out iraqi military tanks using or at least or at least causing drones. at least causing damage anyway and, yeah, and they yeah. would drop what they would do is they would wait for the tank operator. Now I'm I'm getting uh, out of my field of expertise here, as you know. But they would wait for the uh, tank operator to basically open the hatch or something, or if the hatch was open, they would try and they would try and drop the ordnance down into the hatch. You know, sort of a sort of a, a you know an evil version of Saving Private Ryan when they attacked the tanks of the Nazis. You know, this is sort of the ISIS you know sort of version of that. You know, trying to find ways to drop things into the into the hole. Yeah, my my daughter owns the drone that they use to do that. And I've flown it myself. It's very easy. That's what makes the, the sort of the prolifer, even, even though it's low tech, right? The proliferate proliferation of dr drone warfare is, uh, something that the, that we now have to deal with. Right. Um, but as far as the U S and, um, where we stand on that now, the, really the main theater operations for the drone campaign is is in Somalia believe it or not last year there it, it peaked at 55 strikes this is being carried out by the US military or US Africa command um, and Africa Command actually releases press uh, press statements every time it conducts one of these strikes. Uh, they've been very um, open and very transparent on what they're doing. They're targeting Shabab's leadership. 55 strikes last year. This year they're up to, uh, my last count, I believe it was somewhere around 33 or 35. So that campaign is intensifying. It shows, look, Shabab, and we'll have a discussion on this uh, in another future podcast. Yeah, to we're going to do, do a whole episode on Shabab. I'd like to, yeah, walk, I'd like to walk people through that one for sure. Sure. Probably Al Qaeda, Al, you know, is probably most prolific, most yeah. prolific branch of Al Qaeda. Probably, yeah. right? Their insurgency. I mean, and you know, look to go back to what you, you know, we were talking about earlier. The effectiveness, right? We killed, um, uh, we killed the uh, Sheikh Zubair, the first uh, leader of Shabab in a drone strike. Um, we killed a lot of senior Al Qaeda slash Shabab. Shabab is Al Qaeda's branch in East Africa, particularly in Somalia, right? Killed a lot of them, and yet, and yet, the strikes continue. Shabab still. Uh, last year, the U the commander of the U um, U.S. African uh, U.S. Africa Command, um, he stated that Shabab controlled twenty five percent of of Somalia. That was his estimation. And and now that goes back to your point, Bill, about it being an effective tactic, but not a strategy. Right, right? because in, these in groups itself, aren't just. Right. 
terrorist groups. They're in their fight. They're waging insurgencies. The insurgency feeds the terrorism. The terrorism feeds the insurgency. And and so taking out key leaders, it's important. Yes, it keeps them on their back foot. Yemen, um, you know, and what happened? Right, what ha- what happened after they killed Waheshi? They took over a, a, a Hadramat province and the provincial capital for almost a year. AQAP. So his death hurt them, but their military operations continued. And yes, they were able to replace him. And his replacement lasted five years before he was killed. We don't have military commanders leading a command in um, in any theater for five years. This is a point, the resilience and their, their, their longevity. This is a point we constantly make here at Generation Jihad. And yeah, we, the- we have, you know, to put it a different way, you know, you can document America's brain drain on the 9-11 wars. You know, this, yeah. this constant uh, turnover and changeover. We've dealt with it in terms of analysts on the inside. You can also see it in terms of military leadership, intelligence leadership. There's definitely a turnover there, which is disrupts the continuity. And the drones... Um, certainly disrupt their continuity, the jihadis continuity. But I, like you just said, I don't think it's nearly as much as our own turnover, just from natural reasons. We have turnover here, political reasons here. Their turnover is not nearly as, as frequent, I would say. Yeah, we, I mean, look, we obviously have a larger base from the intelligence and military to sure. recruit leaders from. There's as much smaller, but their base stays in the game, in the theaters, typically far, far longer. So they have, they m- might be, you know, narrow in scope, but their but their their depth of knowledge and experience in their theaters is far far greater than ours. We rotate commanders and troops in in timelines of six months to a year. They're doing it over decades, right? I mean, years and decades, if multiple years and decades. Um, yeah, yeah. So Somalia is the hottest zone. Yeah, you, you have Yemen. There was we've only recorded one strike so far this year. That was the one that killed Qasem Arimi, who commanded AQAP after um, Waheshi's death for five years before he was actually killed. And before um, that, he was a military commander of AQAP was, for was, six years, you know, or right. close to it, you know, about that, you know. So, I mean, and before that, of course, he was in Yemen. He escaped from prison in 2006, I think it was. And before that, his career went back to the 1990s in Afghanistan. So, yay, Team America. We got a guy in January 2020 who first started waging jihad for al-Qaeda in the late 1990s. That's okay. what we're talking about when it comes to continuity. And I know Phil... Phil Hexeth is actually listening to this. I said this during congressional testimony one time. I said, we're still killing guys that, uh, you know, first started waging jihad in the 1980s. And Phil loved that. And I know he clipped that for stuff that we use at FDD. Well, here's the point, people. This is the same point, right? Qasem Oremi, yeah, great. They got him in January 2020. He started waging jihad for Al-Qaeda in the 1990s. So this isn't exactly a, uh, you know, rapid turnover here of personnel, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, the velocity of the campaign, in other words, isn't, isn't as high as maybe some think it is. Yeah, I mean, like you know, two, 2017, 125 strikes against AQAP. One, that's again, uh, averages out to about one every three days. Obviously, it's not enough, right? I mean, AQAP still no, yeah, AQ, rural AQAP has, yeah, they have other problems. They've got the fight they the do. Iranian-backed, uh, you know, rebels, and they've got uh, other critics inside Yemen problems, and it's a multi-sided fight. AQAP definitely has a lot of pro- a lot of trouble, but we haven't seen the drones didn't deliver the death knell and nothing really has yet to them yep and that's the point we make and now the u.s is also conducting a limited number of strikes in in inside of libya it's unclear to me what is happening in the in the sahel i know the u.s has bases in uh niger niger, niger there was a base that they had an expensive base i think they built in niger, I, right i for, believe they're closing it too which yeah I, they're I closing found. yeah because that's part of, that's part of big dod wants to get away from the 9 11 Counter- wars. Ter- right. Yeah, counterterrorism, yeah. So, and it's unclear if the U.S. actually. Now, the French have conducted strikes. I believe they've used conventional and um, drones as well. Um, so, but it's a, you know, I, I haven't seen any uh, claimed strikes from the U.S. on in, inside the Sahel. But yeah, that's that's sort of it. I mean, outside of Somalia, we're not seeing a, a lot of activity. Again, this is in the areas outside of the hot zones. Again, that being Afghanistan, um, Iraq, Syria, the ones the declared areas of military operations um, by the U.S. So yeah, that's where it stands. So. These groups aren't going away. Yes, they have their problems. Yes, they suffered um, um, loss of leadership and key operatives. Um, you know, but as we noted, the you know these there's guys just coming up in the ranks for you know Waheshi. I'm sorry, Kasim Al Rimi sat for years as a deputy to to Nasir Al Waheshi at AQAP's Amir. 
before he got his chance, and his successor, Batarfi, who you identified probably a decade ago, if not longer, as a key AQAP figure, um, he wa- he waited his decade to get his chance to lead AQAP. Yeah, it, pro- it probably wasn't a decade ago, but it was a while ago. Yeah, it was years yeah. ago for sure. Yeah. Any, I mean, I just any, remember, any, I, I'm any, going back and I remember statements and we're noting sure. he's talking about this. So, we, you know, we're, we're not publishing about a guy like yeah. Batarfi if, unless he matters, right? So, yeah, and look, the drones are probably hunting Batarfi right now, or you would assume they are. But we'll see. You know, we'll see how long he can last or others. But the bottom line is that they're going to keep fighting no matter what the U.S. decides to do long run here. I think we should probably wrap it up there for this week. We think, Bill. I think we got it. Gave, 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 the, gave the drones a good go. We could we could record three or four episodes just on the drones. We gave you a sort of a smattering, a worldwide picture over time of what we've been covering for years, and we'll we'll come back to this, I'm sure, in, in probably future episodes. But I want to thank uh, our audience again for listening to this week's episode of Generation Jihad. Please do subscribe to the show. If you like it, uh, you can uh, leave a positive review. If you don't like it, well then don't leave a review. Uh, and I'm, I'm not kidding. Uh, and anyway, as a reminder, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your shows. We'll see you next week, and thanks again. <laughs>